well, let's get started here. So thank you everyone for coming. I want to thank everyone for showing up today, you know, taking time out of your day during the lunch hour. And we're really excited for the FedTech Ventures Venture Studio showcase we have today. All right. So by way of an agenda here, we have a quick intro and welcome from me. We'll have some opening rem remarks from Asim Subedi, followed by introdu introductions from our judges today. Then we're going to go into team pitches. So that's going to be seven minutes of the team pitching, followed by five to 10 minutes of live Q&A. After that, I'm going to leave with the judges to go deliberate. And then we're, we're going to bump back into this meeting with the winner and announce them. All right. So for anybody who's not super familiar with the FedTech program, by way of an introduction here, you know, we are a DC based venture firm that really prioritizes work on deep tech tech deep technologies. So that can be, you know, anything from, you know, work with NASA to work with BARDA that like we have here, lots of uh, DOD work we do as well, but really focus on deep tech. And we have a few different product portfolios here. So we have internal innovation, which is where we come in and work with researchers at federal labs, university labs on a really one-on-one -on -one kind of hands-on basis to help improve their technology commercialization process and their, path to and their path to tech transfer. Then we also have the startup studios work we do, which is what this kind of program is, where we pair up entrepreneurs with uh, really cutting edge technology that's in a federal lab or a university lab. And then we also have our accelerator work and our professional services. So the accelerator work is more late stage companies. You know, they've been, they've been around a while and we really focus on you know, getting them, you know, out into the market and accelerating their work, no pun intended, as fast as we can. And then we also have professional services. So that's more along the lines of consulting, research analysis, and technology diligence. All right. So next slide, please. All right. So we have a really impressive track record with doing all this. We have over $2 billion invested from private investors into these kind of companies that we work with. We have over $3.1 million invested from you know, private, private contractors and federal contracts awarded to our companies. And then through programs like this and the startup studios, over 100 companies have been created around federal and university lab IP. And then this is kind of a roadmap of the work that all the teams in the program showcasing today went through over the past few months. So they start with a boot camp day where they're meeting the inventors, talking through this technology that's really new to them. Then over the rest of phase one, they go through the process of validating their business model, validating their hypothesis, doing a ton of customer discovery to get out there and talk to potential customers. And then once they have a good idea of where their, what their product is, what their solution is, then they move into phase two, where they focus more on business creation, uh, how they handle their IP portfolio, their legal strategy. And then we really coach them on fundraising and the whole dynamics of getting their company out in the market. And then this all culminates in the venture showcase days like today. And then, you know, this whole process really takes a village. You know, these teams have tons of calls with industry experts, technology transfer, and we really emphasize the importance of the network to them. None of this would have been possible without their coaches, their mentors, all the advisors. And I want to give a special shout out today, too, to coaches Ryan Daly and Gabe Hitchcock. None of this would have been possible without them. They were with the entrepreneurs in these meetings every night, every Wednesday night from 6 to 730 one, you know, one-on-one -on -one coaching and really getting to know them and help them through this whole process. And I also want to thank Manbir Singh too. He is our main point of contact with Barda now. And this, this whole program was in large part, his kind of brainchild. So this wouldn't have been possible without him either. And the, and the labs, most importantly, the, the labs, you know, they did the, the work of upfront of the invention. So we can't thank our inventors enough, but I want to move up to our main program sponsors here. So Barda and NIST were the program sponsors. Um, again, I keep saying it, but none of this would have been possible without them. And I have some words from Asim Subedi up next. Thanks, so, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Great, um, ready to go or do you, can I start? Yeah, please do, yep. go ahead. 
Perfect. Uh, yeah, thanks, John, and thanks to everyone at FedTech. Uh, I, I'm not going to use any slides. I'll just, you know, talk briefly. I don't want to. Uh, I, I know everyone would rather hear from the the teams and all the exciting innovative technologies, and from the judges rather than me. Uh, but I wanted to spend some time to tell uh, everyone here who might not be as familiar with BARDA and the Division of Research, Innovation, and Ventures within BARDA and uh, about what we do uh, and a little bit about the Startup Studio pilot that you know where we currently are. Uh, I'm going with with FedTech and the culmination of that the 16 week long program. Uh, so Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority BARDA uh, is uh, in, it's a government agency within the Department of Health and Human Services. We've been around for about 16 years now, uh, and our primary goal uh, for uh, or the reason for starting our agency and our primary goal is to really uh, develop medical countermeasures that will help us be prepared for and respond to any public health emergency. And so that could be because of any health security threats from chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear threats emerging infectious diseases, pandemic influenza, other pathogens, uh, and time of microbial resistance, uh, anything that could lead to a public health emergency. And uh, the approach we take here at BARDA to get these medical countermeasures out there and be ready to be deployed and uh, to develop it is public-private partnership. We are very much a public-private partnership driven organization. And uh, one of, I think, uh, the measures of our success, the way we look at, like, have we been successful in accomplishing the goal that we have set out to do uh, is by looking at how many products have we been able to bring forward uh, that will help us, either has already helped us uh, with some of the public health emergencies and pandemics uh, that we have had to deal with, uh, but also for other future sort of health security threats that might emerge. Uh, and so uh, right up until today, we've gotten 70 products through FDA approval, licenses, and clearances, uh, which I think for 16 years is definitely a great number. And again, that is because of the, the partnership we have been able to build with our private sector partners. It's also because of the, the expertise we have within BARDA to really support these product teams, not just with funding, but also with expertise as it relates to product development, as it relates to regulatory and uh, other guidances as well. And the Division of Research, Innovation, and Ventures within BARDA was started uh, about five years ago with the goal of uh, supporting early stage innovation, the next generation cutting edge technologies that will help us be prepared for the, that next pandemic or that next public health emergency we might have to deal with, right? And our focus and goal is really to support innovators and entrepreneurs across their product development journey, wherever they might be. And so we understand that some of the innovators might be really early stage at the early uh, sort of you know development phase where what they really value is in addition to funding that mentorship and guidance, ac access to incubator space or access to mentors and experts. Uh, so we have programs around that. Uh, we, we have companies that might be looking for really early stage capital to help with technology de-risking or to de-risk that regulatory pathway or to de-risk their commercial and some approach and pathway. And we have funding and programs around that. Uh, a lot of companies need that accelerator support to try to figure out what their commercialization path should look like or what you know their, uh, their products should look like. We have programs to support that. So we have programs that and, and funding programs as well as resource-based programs that we have designed and built to support innovators and entrepreneurs across that journey. And so uh, we have funding opportunities, I mentioned, uh, within DRIVE, we fund projects through what we call EGBAA, Broad Agency Announcement, uh, where we support technologies and companies with uh, funding up to $750,000 the phase one and then we have a phase second phase of phase uh easyba plus where companies that have successfully completed all the milestones can request uh additional funding as well and then we have partnership with several of our private sector partners uh including johnson and johnson and rachel rath who is here <laughs> as a judge uh is our partner on the other side at jnj we have a program called Blue Knight, uh, which supports innovators and companies at uh, both at the early stage and even like somewhat later stage 
with both resources, uh, and that includes access to the incubator space at one of the JLF's locations globally, as well as mentorship and access to resources, both AJ and J and BARDA. We have partners with 13 different accelerators around the country where we have created the BARDA Accelerator Network, where companies have access to wraparound support and access to the accelerator support that these accelerators provide. And we also last, uh, about two years ago, <clears throat> created a venture partnership with Global Health Investment Corporation. Uh, and so it's our attempt at equity-based investment where uh, the goal is to work with GHIC to make investments in uh, companies that are working in our mission space, but also are developing technologies that have both commercial feasibility and kind of commercial sustainability pathway, but also could be applied to help us be prepared for any public health emergency. Uh, and that partnership has been going strong. Uh, it's uh, it's again the the it's a different funding model, uh, really working with the private sector partners to crowd the uh, private sector funding in in the areas we care about. Uh, with that partnership with GHIC, the GHIC part of this partnership has already invested in eleven companies. These are equity based investments, uh, and again uh, with a growing portfolio, uh, and so. As I mentioned, like our goal is to really identify the gaps within the preparedness and response uh, in terms of figuring out what do we need to be prepared for the next public health emergency. And one of the gaps we did identify was that at a really early stage, there are a lot of technologies that are stuck in the lab or there are areas where there is not as much innovation happening from companies being created. And uh, so we uh, partnered with uh, FedTech that have been doing this for several years now to create a cohort that is focused on health security. Uh, and so it has been a great partnership. Uh, we started with weekly calls to look at all the different IPs that they were able to source, not just from federal national labs, but from also universities across the US. Uh, together, we looked at all those IPs, I think like FedTech looked at probably thousands of IPs, but we they only sent 150 of these IPs to us that we looked at. We then picked six technologies that were within scope and on mission for us in areas where we are not seeing as much innovation. Uh, those six teams, technologies were then FedTech the recruited entrepreneurs, which uh, several of you, you will hear from. Uh, that went through the whole 16 week program. And it's been great to see the progress from when this team of entrepreneurs came together on that technology and where they have brought today. Uh, and it's been amazing to see that journey. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to the presentations from all of them today and the feedback from judges. Uh, and yeah, again, would like to thank the FedTech team. It's been a great collaboration. Uh, and um, I think John thanked Manveer, but I also want to thank Manveer <laughs> for both like when he was at FedTech for leading this program and bringing it to where it is today. And then now that he's within Border Drive, uh, really taking the program forward. And I think like from our perspective, even if I mean, I'm really hopeful that several of these companies will go out and do amazing things and uh, really take the technologies forward. But at least uh, if nothing else works out, we're really glad that we got to meet Manbir and now he's part of the team. So uh, really <laughs> glad that, uh, FedTech was able to uh, help us like with that connection. Uh, with that, I'll stop there. I, I don't know if there is time for any questions. Happy to take any questions, but really looking forward to uh, hearing from all the different all the teams and uh, and their journey and the technology and uh, the feedback from us is awesome. All right, thank you, Asim, and can't thank you enough for all your partnership throughout this whole process. It's been great working with you guys. So up next, we have our judges for today. So left to right, we have Rachel Rath, who's the director of the Barter Alliance at Johnson & Johnson, like Asim mentioned. We also have Nakia Melisio, who's the principal of Venture Lab at Georgia Tech. Nakia is having some technical issues, so he might be running a bit late. Uh, but we also have Ernesto Shinona, who's the VP of Business Development and Government Affairs at CSSI Life Sciences. And last but not least, we have Tom Martin, who's a director here at FedTech, and he runs about half our programming, including this uh, project in particular. All right. And then as far as the pitches and judging goes, we're going to have seven-minute pitches followed by five to ten minutes of Q&A. So those pitches are recorded just to eliminate any possible technical difficulties for the teams, but then the teams will come on live for the Q&A session. And then for judges, 
we have three main metrics that we're judging the, the pitches themselves on. So it's how well does this pitch instill confidence, uh, the team's ability to drive the venture forward, how well does the pitch uh, show a clear value proposition for the technology solution, and how well thought out is the business model, competitive analysis, and pathway to market. All right, so these are five really incredible teams pitching today. You know, I've had the pleasure of working with them every Wednesday night from 6 to 7.30. Um, you know, they put an incredible amount of effort in, into all of this, and it's been really, really impressive to see how far they've come from the beginning, way, way back in the beginning of this program. So we have Biomembretics, Inflamasense, Nestal Biosciences, Lumos, and Halex. So if you'd like to get in contact with any of these teams after the fact, we are sending around a flyer with all their information and contact information. And then we'll also have a link to their websites on these slides as well. All right, so first up, we have Biomembretics. That's a team of Todd Astor, who's the CEO, Jeffrey Bornstein, who's the technical, the technical executive, uh, Mike McCullough, who's the chief business and finance expert, and then Steve London, who's the legal expert. Now, Biomembretics is working on a technology for um, smart lung treatment for patients with ARDS. And I'm going to kick it over to Joel to share the video. Hello, my name is Todd Astor, and I'm the founder and CEO of Biomembretics. But I'm also a physician who specializes in lung failure, lung transplantation. I launched Biomembretics after years of frustration and heartache at seeing so many of our patients die because we just didn't have sufficient technology to support their failing lungs. Well, with Biomembretics, we're developing a new frontier, creating the optimal blend of nature and machine to help patients with organ failure, starting first with the lung. Well, why focus on the lung first? Because lung failure truly represents a global crisis, a pandemic even before the COVID-19 pandemic, with $170 billion spent every year the third leading cause of death worldwide. And two million patients every year are admitted to intensive care units because of the treatment of the lung failure with mechanical ventilators. The problem is that these mechanical ventilators are a completely inadequate standard of care for lung failure, because in the simplest terms, these ventilators blow air in and out of the lung. So it stands to reason that when the lungs failure fail, this therapy will be ineffective. Not only that, it requires the patient to be immobilized, sedated and sometimes paralyzed. And even worse, it causes even more injury to the lungs. So we've all been encouraged with the evolution of a promising therapy over the last two decades, known as the artificial lung or ECMO. And on its surface, it's the optimal therapy. It filters the blood directly, bypasses the lungs, allowing the lungs to rest and heal, or is a bridge to lung transplantation. The problem though is until now, these devices, and in particular, the core of these devices, the membrane or the filter, have been designed in an artificial way, causing significant blood clotting complications in almost half the patients. This leads to high mortality rates and very high cost, ultimately limiting the use of this therapy for only a fraction of the potential patient. If you look at this graph, you can see that even one complication considerably increases the risk of death while on ECMO therapy. So how do we get around these blood clotting, clotting complications? How do we bypass this artificial design? What if we could actually copy nature's blueprint for the human lung itself? Well, that's precisely what we're doing at Biomembretics, mimicking nature's blood path with the bioengineering miracle of microfluidity. When you look at the human lung, you can see that the blood is carried through networks of these very tiny blood vessels with a very specific structure and branching pattern. Well, with the proprietary computational approach, we can replicate this blood path and create these micron scale dimension and angular branching pattern channels to recreate that safe path of the human lung. And then we can magnify, scale this, creating layers of membranes that's capable of human level blood flow. Well, why is this microfluidic advantage so important? Because by recreating this precision blood flow control, we can create a truly safe environment for the blood, eliminating that dangerous blood clotting and even improving the gas exchange. Contrast this to the uncontrolled blood flow in conventional membranes that have a, an artificial hollow fiber structure. Hollow fiber meaning that there are hollow fibers carrying this oxygen 
And then there's blood just being forced in and around these fibers in a turbulent, non-uniform, high pressure, high share manner, causing damage to the blood and promoting that dangerous blood clotting. Well, there are a lot of these competitor membranes on the market. Each has their own bells and whistles, but none of them have the microfluidic advantage, the natural blood path, the low share blood flow, the highest possible gas transfer, and this reduced blood clotting. Why is the reduced blood clotting so important? Because you can eliminate the costly and dangerous membrane changes, eliminate those costly, dangerous blood thinner medications, and eliminate those very dangerous complications, and therefore the complexity of the therapy, improving patient survival, reducing hospital costs, and expanding this therapy for the entire healthcare system. Well, all of this is the result of a pioneering collaboration, bringing my 20 years of experience in lung failure and lung transplantation, together with Dr. Jeffrey Bornstein, our chief technical advisor and the original inventor of the microfluidic technology at the world-renowned Draper Laboratory. What has resulted is a very successful eight-year collaboration, highlighted three years ago by funding of the technology from the U.S. Department of Defense, the $5 million three-year grant. And with that momentum, I launched Biomembretics to take this through clinical development and commercialization. And it's what has resulted is the successful triad collaboration between Biomembretics, Draper, and the Department of Defense. What we're pursuing is a plug-and-play business model. That is, we're not trying to recreate the entire artificial lung device. There are plenty of companies out there doing that. We're trying to transform how these devices work. By taking this technology, taking the intellectual prop property and patents from Draper, and creating these disposable microfluidic membrane lungs, with a projected price point of $7,500 a piece, comparable to current technology, and plugging these directly in to current artificial lung devices, replacing those hollow fiber membranes and transforming that blood clotting complication frequency and then selling these directly to current ECMO manufacturers, either through an acqu complete acquisition or through a licensing or OEM model, or to sell these directly to hospitals to be able to transform their existing ECMO circuits. As I mentioned, the number of current ECMO patients is relatively small. Although if you look over the last 10 years, you can see that even with current technology, this number of patients has increased by five-fold. But of course, we have our eyes on those 2 million patients currently requiring mechanical ventilators. And at the price point for our membranes, that's a $30 billion TAM. And of course, with our relationship with Draper and the Department of Defense, it makes us a dual venture targeting both commercial and military government markets. If you look at the timeline, you can see that although Biomagretics, of course, is a relatively new company, this technology has been in development and scaling for over a decade already achieving a proof of concept prototype and validation, a human scale prototype, and now moving towards our clinic ready prototype and a commercial scale manufacturing process, all targeting first in human clinical trial and FDA approval in 2024-25 with the goal of a US launch in 2026. And to this point, the funding has all been consisting of grants and Draper, we're now targeting angel and VC funding to add to additional grant funding to be able to get us to that next milestone of first in human testing. And we're currently raising a seed round of $2 million to help us get close to that milestone. With that timeline in mind, you can see that we're anticipating our first revenue in 2026, aiming for 100 patients, and we've already targeted a specific 12 ECMO centers to get us to that target. And you can see that then the revenue will increase over the years as we tap into the ECMO market, but also, again, as we look towards that much larger TAM. This technology has already had a tremendous amount of traction over the years, as I had mentioned, highlighted recently by the most significant milestone, the first ever successful animal study with a human-scale microfluidic device of any kind. We successfully supported large animals for over 24 hours without any significant blood clotting, any significant blood damage, and with stable pressures. It's, it's important to note, there are a couple of other groups out there working in this microfluidic space, their academic labs, but they have yet to come close to achieving a human scale prototype or being able to support large animals. This, this significant success has resulted in external validation from a number of sources, 
the MIT Technology Review published an article as, as this technology as the safer alternative to ventilators. And last summer, Dr. Bornstein and I published a cover story in artificial organs, which we were coined the optimal blend of nature and machine. Taking all this together, this transformative life-saving technology, powerful global IP, expert team and collaborators, early traction and validation, a versatile pipeline, established pathway, an expansive market. You can see we've gone a long way to de-risking this venture, and we're seeking partnerships for $2 million in seed funding to help us advance the clinical trial. Thank you. All right, thank you, Todd. Fantastic video. I'll kick it over to the judges for questions. Great, well, wonderful presentation. This is Tom Martin with FedTech. And so Todd, um, you've been working on this for eight years and it's amazing that you got the $5 million grant. Um, but you started to talk about kind of a plug and play model at 7,500. So my question is with the, the different ECMO uh, apparatus, how many different variations are there out there and how much customization would you need to do? For your uh, for your uh, to be able to have a sizable amount of, of of your technology in the in the ECMO device. Yeah, thanks, Tom. That's a great question. Uh, so the the way that these uh, currently the cartridges with the membranes integrated in the circuits is is actually fairly seamless. Um, so that the technical aspects of of just replacing the current cartridges with a cartridge that contains our novel membrane technology would, in a perfect world, be relatively simple. There was, there was a movement over the years to integrate the membranes with the pumps in these devices, and that would have created a challenge in the long run. But now the movement has been away from that because of the cost that every time you have to change out these membranes, you also have to change out the pump with it. So the whole field is moving back towards just having the membrane as a separate component which really supports our plug and play model uh, quite well. Great, thank you, Todd. Sure. Over to Anessa. Thank you very much, Todd, for that wonderful presentation. Todd, um, do you have any sense of when you will reach design freeze with your with your technology and is this final prototype going to be a manufacturing equivalent prototype? Yeah, thanks, Vanessa. That's a, that's a great question and, and really kind of um, points to the strategy that we're taking. So to this point, we've our goal has been, what really the goal for microfluidics has been for decades, which is scaling. Scaling has always been the major barrier um, to be able to get to a point where a device can handle human level flow. Uh, so we've achieved that. Uh, that has been the, 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 the truly great accomplishment um, of our technology. Uh, so the next step then of course is two things. One is to get to a clinic ready uh, uh, footprint, footprint from both a size and a cost standpoint, but also a manufacturing process that supports high throughput scaling. And so we're doing those together because we want to make sure that the final clinic ready product that we bring to clinical trial is being produced by the commercial scale manufacturing process. So we've kind of stopped with the R&D portion of our development to focus now on sort of the clinic prototype, both the prototype itself and the process to make that prototype. And that's what we'll use for all our validation studies for regulatory approval. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And and your timeline for that is 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 twelve months. Is that correct? Yeah. So that's our, our next milestone is really to reach that. So really, it somewhat depends on our fundraising, um, but with the funds, it's somewhere between a year and a year and a half. We project we'll be ready for clinical trial. Thanks Great so much. Yeah. Thanks so much. Todd for the for the presentation. Nice job. I wanted to dive in a little bit more to the competitive analysis. 
So you initially showed a competitive slide with a number of characteristics where you just blew the competition out of the water, right? You see all those check marks for your technology and lots of X's on the others. And then later you talked about two academic universities working on technologies to compete. Could you talk about how, besides being further along in development from those two academic groups, how does your technology compete with what they're developing? Sure, no, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, so, so I look at this sort of with three, to three components. You know, I think when we present this at conferences, we presented this data at many, many conferences, I think the feedback has been universal, um, both from clinicians and scientists in the space, which is microfluidics is clearly the next step for organ failure technology. Just to, to be able to get around hemocompatibility, you need to have some type of flow that's natural and different from what we see with hollow fiber membrane technology. So I think that's an accepted premise. Within that premise, we're clearly light years ahead of anyone else in the space. And a lot of it has to do with, the, and I can't sort of talk a lot about the proprietary stuff, but a lot of it has to do with the, our ability to have scaled this technology, to be able to scale it to this level of blood flow, which is exactly what our advantage has been beyond those other groups that have been out there. But I think the third, and this is really where we have the competitive advantage is we control all of the early IP and patents around all of the microfluidic design and technology, the computational approach, the microfluidic design and the fabrication processes. And those patents not only apply to lung, the lung space, but other applications as well. We have a, uh, just under 20 patents um, that established the foundation of microfluidic use in organ failure devices. So it's going to be very, very difficult for any competitors to replicate what we're doing or the success we're having because of our control over all of that early IP regarding microfluidic design. Thank you. In the interest of time, I think we have time for one last question for Todd. Let's go over to Ernesto. So one of your main goals is to license the technology to it, this artificial lung manufacturer segment. Um, have you had any conversations with any of those manufacturers and, and have they been receptive to, to this idea? Yes, uh, you know, I mean, that was really some of the, the customer discovery I did at a very early time point was really to talk. And of course, there's always at that risk with the very early time points about the discussions with the existing ECMO groups um, in terms of being early in your development. But they were very helpful because they helped guide where we were taking our product, how we were designing it, what our eventual applications would be. And there's tremendous interest. I mean, I, I don't want to reveal all the companies I talked to right here, but uh, they're all of the big players in the space, uh, really, not only the up and coming ones, but the ones that control the whole, you know, the whole market right now. Very interested, um, even realizing that this would supplant their, their technology, they also realize how transformative this would be for their, their devices. Um, so I, I think that the closer we get to the clinic ready prototype and certainly generating first in human data, that's where I think we're going to have a lot of suitors. In fact, we already have a lot of suitors from those groups. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Todd. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Tal Lally, CEO of Nestle Biosciences. Today, we're here to talk about a very important very issue important that affects 6.7 million patients or patients with chronic wounds that is not adequately addressed. These are due to a number of reasons, including the aging population, longer lifespan, antibiotic resistance. These patients who have diabetic wounds, pressure wounds, bed sores, venous ulcers, and arterial ulcers. So what is the solution? The solution is smart wounds, a technology that encompasses novel electrical stimulation or e stim technology that is transparent, does not stick to the wound, does not require removal, allows remote monitoring, faster healing, and extended use. In the words of a stakeholder, 
it's time for wound care to better use technology to advance this field of medicine. The chronic wound market is 23B market, of which 9.3B is directly spent on wound care therapies and dressings. The SOM component we estimate conservatively to be at 1.9B. How does the smart wound technology work? It has embedded electrodes that stimulates healing, has an angiogenic effect, in other words, allows new blood vessel growth. It has sensors for remote monitoring. It is transparent, so it saves the caretaker or caregivers an infinite amount of time to check the status of the wound without removal of the dressing. It has a moist absorbent layer that helps healing and essentially 20% acceleration in healing itself. In addition, studies have shown compared to the standard of care is a significant reduction in the bacterial load by the use of our technology as depicted in blue. The patent portfolio is extensive, as well as a long runway of at least 10 years or longer. The commercialization pathway is as follows. The human trials are underway currently, completion by the summer, at which point we will embark on seed round funding, IP licensing, design, development, engineering, and SPIR grant apps. Q1 of next year, we expect a clinical trial, a second clinical trial underway, and be production ready. In, in time for 510k approval, subsequent quarter or Q3, and have distribution channels, sale channels, as well as government channels for procurement. Q3 of 2025, we expect a second round of funding engagement to scale up operations. Our team comprises myself as the CEO with 20 plus years in sales and marketing and new product launch experience. James Nesbitt, our chief risk officer, as well as compliance, manufacturing, and deep government channel experience. Roger Anderson, COO, CEO, and sales and marketing experience. Our technical team involves Dr. Bogey, the inventor of the technology, Dr. Roberts, biomedical engineer as well, Dr. Comprey, clinical advisor, Dr. Neolani, who's got extensive M&A experience and a serial entrepreneur in the med space, and Nancy Coy, a serial entrepreneur of FinTech slash MedTech. The competitive landscape, on the left side, you'll notice the companies that have the traditional product for wound care therapy that involves or entails negative wound pressure therapy. On top left and the bottom left, the dressings, both of which are growing at a rate of under 5%. On the right side, you will notice smart devices, top right, and smart dressings, bottom right. The smart dressings, so-called, is due to its ability to remotely monitor either pH, moisture, or temperature. So that leaves us in the top right-hand corner where there's only four companies of which two are essentially monitoring capabilities. They do not provide any therapeutic value which leaves only one other company called Vomaris, has a cloth type material that has an embedded battery that is activated upon contact with moisture. However, it's somewhat restrictive in the sense that it does not have continuous e stim component through external sources like we do. It does not allow for observation, status check with the one without removal of the bandage, and it does not have remote monitoring. So that leaves us in a very unique position as a company, having a product that is smart device, so-called, however, smart plus it does have a therapeutic option or therapeutic value of e-stimulation. And that sector is growing six times faster than everything on the left. So we are uniquely positioned to capture the market in a high growth segment. The funds allocation will be towards, of course, R&D, clinical studies, marketing, regulatory, and manufacturing. The profitability forecast, we expect revenue in 2026 and thereafter significant growth there for the next five year projections. Our partners, stakeholders, and associations, including FedTech and VA, our licensor, and Nestle Group, which is significantly embedded and credentialed in NGOs and government levels, including the United Nations, Global Marketplace, NATO, DLA, GSA, SAM, FEMA, and Resilient Network, as well as Wilmington and Boyd, 
that supports commercial and business intelligence for us. Our ask is five mil to be to be uh, in the market and that would be essentially deployed towards R and D, clinical study, payroll, distribution, marketing, and manufacturing. In summary, we have an experienced team. We have a patent to technology within the 23B growing market with an unmet need and a deep network with government, VA, and NGOs. So smart wounds, we believe, is a smart move in wound care. We believe we're in the right place at the right time. Thank you. All right, judges, what questions do you have for Nestel? Uh, yeah, I'll jump in with my, my question. Um, so I, I have two technical questions, and this is more or less to, I guess, get a better characterization around your value proposition and where you differentiate yourself, because there are a lot of people trying to tackle this particular problem. So the first question I have is related to how does this technology fare up against, you know, let's just say people with excessive weight, for instance, like, for instance, right, you got the subcutaneous tissue, and then you've got excessive fat cells. And typically, where you see in obese patients with comorbidities, they also have a harder time in healing. So with this technology, how have you run initials? Are there any initial tests, I would say, around kind of the outcomes and the value around that? Because I know that's one of the major issues um, in terms of wound healing. So that's my first question. Um, and then the second question is, is also related around biofilming is also a big issue um, in relationship to um, electric wound or wound healing as well. And just wanted to see if you all have thought about that in terms of where your segmentation to what's already existing on the market. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in, in regards to your second question on the biofilm, apparently it, it appears as though there's some impact on the biofilm. Uh, there's been some data showing that there's a significant reduction in the bacteria load compared to the standard of care. So that's the extent of the studies we have. However, currently there are human trials in the way, which we will have additional data uh, towards the end of the study. Uh, and then your first question was in regards to the, the obese patients and other characteristics. We don't have enough data yet on that. Uh, however, if there is excessive exudate, that may not be appropriate application for the, for the technology. It'll be more confined to on the lesser side of, of, of application. Okay, so you have a further segmentation and is what yes. I'm hearing out of that. Okay, awesome, yes. thank you. Hey, Tom, this is Tom. Uh, yes. Wonderful presentation, pleasure to work with you guys. Um, when you look at the unit economics compared to the left side of your four by four chart, traditional care, and then you have your upper right with electronic uh, band-aids and your other value propositions. What's the, um, what's the unit economics on, the, on your upper right comparative to, to, uh, to the left? So if we're spending X number of dollars for this new wound care, well, how much is it reducing either time in hospital or healing? Uh, how is it, is, I think you said 20% Faster, but what does that mean from a from an average cost perspective? If you have that, well, the twenty percent acceleration data, of course, is is there. However, from a price standpoint, what we're seeing is the negative wound pressure therapy, which is two point five B space. Um, the price points on that product, the products range is any up to six hundred dollars. So the way we're pricing our technology is essentially about $350. That's a box of two. That's about $175. And it could last up to seven days. So from a value standpoint, I think it's, it's, it's a greater value than the standard negative wound pressure therapy products. So forth. But depending, there's some self-administered, some are administered in the hospital, uh, in the clinic environment. And so typically they go up to $600 per unit. Thank you. Rachel? Thanks, Tom. Um, I want to start by thanking you guys for your presentation and echoing one of the comments I think that was made on the previous presentation, which was, uh, I think this is a really competitive space. 
we see, you know, a lot of companies trying to address the, the real challenges in wound healing from across the spectrum of earlier detection, earlier treatment, smart bandages. And so I, I think it is a very competitive space and I applaud you for trying to bring your really innovative technology into it. I would just make you sort of make sure you're aware of that and thinking about that as you position it competitively moving forward. Um, I saw in your presentation that you're in initial clinical trials today. I think you had that on one of your slides. You had clinical trials underway. So as part of that or separately, have you had any customer discovery conversations with the providers or with hospital systems or with potential patients as well where you've gotten some feedback? We have, and the clinicians that we have had some discussions on. I think the value proposition where you have a visual visual without removal is a, is a big factor because what you would really see in, in the clinical setting is each time a patient visits, at every patient visit, essentially you remove the bandages or the traditional dressings in order to see progress of the wound. However, if you have the capability of visually see it without removal, that's a big deal actually. And, that, and in terms of convenience and cost savings and time savings as well. So that seems to be resonate well. The other point is that the, uh, the remote monitoring option is a value proposition, of course. And then, of course, the accelerated healing has value, but again, there's not enough data to compare it, although it seems neck and neck with some of the other products in the market, which are more traditional negative wound pressure therapies and advanced wound dressings and so forth. So, however, this, this segment is growing rapidly for the, for the for number of reasons I pointed out in the presentation. So, it's a 6x faster growth in this segment than the traditional, which is where we're really competing against with the negative wound pressure therapies, the traditional dressings, the advanced dressings, which comprise about 7.5B market. Uh, so it's a substantial market, but I think where we're going is in the right direction as far as what we see. Thank you. All right, any more questions from our judges? We have time for one or two more. So one point I want to bring up is we are also exploring the government channels, which is something uh, not typical. Uh, and James heads up that part of it. Uh, James, do you have any uh, anything you want to add on the government channels that we're exploring? Uh, it's James. I think you're muted. It's muted. There you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, my side of the uh, of the business is uh, the compliance and the um, instituting of the Nestle Group, where it needs to be on in government levels. Uh, what we do um, is, while Tal has been himself uh, on the American side of the spectrum. Um, uh, discussing with stakeholders and doctors and hospitals. Uh, ours is to um, embed ourselves into where the markets are, um, where we are registered in with, I think it's about 3,800 hospitals uh, as, as buying groups. Uh, we're, we're in with the, uh, the UN, uh, the World Health Organization, um, and then downwards into the US government. Now, with that, we're looking at this product itself uh, going, going to be uh, used or taken up by state government, hospitals, um, and uh, the VA itself, as well as um, the defense agencies. Um, while Tal has been looking at the, at the, um, technology in regards to its application we also see further than that after we go to commercialization where we can go into other trials which actually increases the use of this specific bandage or this dressing uh, for other applications which doubles at least its um, its use um, and that would be where this bandage is right now, it's uh, a viewable screen. You can look at the wound um, and you can open and dress the wound and take samples. 
uh, for all these issues regarding diabetic sores and everything else. My side is to take with this company to its further stage where this can be used to cover uh, impact wounds and uh, fungal issues. And these dressings uh, will handle that, but uh, we have to do new trials for that and new applications for it. The base of what Tao has done with this application has multiple uses throughout. And um, the market uh, for impact wounds and fungal infections is 10 times more than the diabetic issues. So that's where I work at a growing the macro or creating the macro rather than uh, the starting off this, which is Tal is so important to get us off the ground to uh, push this device uh, along. All right, thank you team. That's all we have time for for questions and we'll move along to the next pitch. All right, and next up we have Lumos Nano Labs, which is led by Jason Huffnagel as the CEO and Bijou Matthew as the CTO. So they're working on a, an optofluidic flow meter, which implements a novel patented technology for fluid measurements that are up to 100 times more precise than conventional instruments. Hi, I'm Jason Huffnagel, co-founder of Lumos Nano Labs. Our team is focused on delivering precision measurement solutions. Before I get started, I'd like to talk about why measurement matters. Since the beginning, humans have used measurements to accomplish great things. In ancient times, the Egyptians used the cubit to build the pyramids. The Roman foot was used to construct roads and interconnect the Roman Empire. And in the 18th century, the French Academy of Sciences proposed a new measurement system what became the metric system, and then later led to the calculations that enabled the US moon landing. Nearly everything we enjoy today is informed by a measurement standard of one kind or another. Now, perhaps the importance of measurement becomes all the more clear when we look at the field of medicine, where accurate measurement is a matter of life or death. Specifically, I wanna focus on one of the most common treatments used in hospitals and clinics around the world, infusion therapy. Infusion therapy is a medical procedure that's used across age groups, from newborn babies to the elderly, and it's used to administer tre for treatments for diseases like cancer and rheumatoid arthritis. Unfortunately, infusion therapies are subject to flow rate variability. In fact, medical reviews have connected the uncertain measurements of existing infusion devices to lasting health damage, unnecessary human suffering, and even death. Bucking this status quo means reducing dosing errors which will translate into positive care differences for patients by preventing fluid overload, electrolyte imbalances, or medication toxicity. For this reason, there is a need to more precisely measure the amount of medication a patient receives. For our first product, Lumos is working on a powerful nanoscale optofluidic flow meter. Simply put, the flow meter uses novel microfluidic technology and processes that leverages light emitters, fluorescent molecules, and the known relationship between the photo bleaching of these fluorophores and light intensity to determine flow rates. As such, it can provide nurses and other healthcare professionals real-time awareness of the medication patients receive, giving them greater control to properly measure and administer medication. So how well does it measure? Here you see the real-time measurement of the technology on the left with upstream and downstream measures showing 40 nanoliter per minute changes. They're clearly registering on the screen in a stair-step pattern. On the bottom right, you see the best conventional flow meter in the world taking the same measurement, and well, it doesn't care at all about these changes. It's basically flat. This is how much better the technology is doing than the best instruments in the world. So that begs the question, why are the market's best products so insufficiently precise at the nanoliter regime? Well, improvements in sensitivity at flow rates relies on miniaturization. And as they miniaturize, existing benchtop technologies introduce variables like evaporation, friction, and instrument noise. These variables make relative uncertainty so large that they overwhelm the flow measurement with error. Now, the technology we're working with precisely measures dynamic flows down to one nanoliter per minute with 95% certainty. This results in measurements that are 100 times better than the currently available commercial instruments. 
Overall, we see three key trends related to infusion therapies. First, modern drugs are increasingly potent. So when a hospital administers a drug like fentanyl, for example, they require technology that reduces the potential for human error. Second, and related to the first, numerous medical studies and reviews point to microfluidics technology as key to improving infusion therapy outcomes. This is the view of one of the lead researchers in this area, Dr. Elsa Batista, who we spoke to during our stakeholder discovery interviews. Lastly, longer life expectancies around the world have resulted in an increase in chronic disease, which is boosting the market demand for infusion therapies. We learned then that in the United States alone, the number of people with at least one chronic disease is estimated to increase by 99.5% by 2050. We've seen numbers valuing the global infusion therapy market at 78.9 billion. Capturing just a half percent of this market, we would see revenue in the hundreds of millions of dollars, a conservative estimate considering the customer benefits the technology offers. Over the course of our stakeholder interviews, a regular set of customer needs emerged consistency, awareness, and control. Simply put, customers need reproducibility, and Lumos enables reproducibility in ways no existing flow meter can. During our conversations with stakeholders, we found other use cases where reproducibility was a key value proposition. In our conversations with bio platform maker, we found a need for low flow sensors and their next gen bioanalytical systems. We're continuing to make inroads in this area of inquiry. We see two pathways to revenue. First, developing a commercial flow meter as a standalone product. And second, working in partnership with medical device or bio platform makers to integrate the flow meter into their existing systems. We've connected with both kinds of companies during our customer discovery process. We plan to use the next couple of months to talk to additional stakeholders. We'll form our company this month, enter into a joint research agreement with the lab we're working with, build a flow meter prototype, and begin applying for non-dilutive funding. Depending on the resulting performance of our prototype, we plan to raise our first round of funding and begin production of a standalone flow meter. We'd like to grow our support ecosystem, and while we're not actively seeking funding at the moment, we'd be grateful for introductions to angels and VC firms. My fellow founder, Bijou, and I are working to commercialize this technology and have a combined background in bioinformatics, automation, sales, and marketing. Gary is a materials scientist, and his expertise will help us with the manufacture of the product. John is a product expert with a background in medical devices. And Ryan, our coach, has an extensive background in technology commercialization. Together, we have the skills to develop, build, and sell this groundbreaking technology. We believe this technology will change the way people think about low flow measurement and that it will not only set new standards, but save lives. Whether you're a future customer, investor, or someone else, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. All right, judges, over to you guys. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump in here. Thanks so much for a, a really great pick. You gave us a teaser, though. Um, pretty early on where you talked about your first product. Um, and so when we're always looking at early stage companies, we like to look at what you're working on today, but also where you see the additional applications into the future and what's next in your pipeline. So you gave us a great teaser. Can you tell us what you're looking at moving forward beyond this first product? Yes, I'm very astute of you, Rachel. Yeah, um, we're just, uh, so the, the base technology that enables the flow meter can actually be applied to uh, a cytometer. Um, so, so measuring cells and, and actually um, it, it can take uh, potentially uh, multiple measurements of the same cell, uh, which would uh, provide for richer data. Perfect, thank you. I'm gonna pass it over to Tom. Uh, thanks, uh, Jason and Bijou, great to see you. So I'd love to understand a little bit more about your Tam and Sam. Um, so what percentage of these kind of designer or high potency uh, infusions are part of the overall market at this, at this stage of the game? I think you had like 350 million or something. I, I can't remember that. Do you remember that? Yeah, sorry. I'm having a hard time hearing you, Tom. Oh, I'm sorry. So in the infusion therapies, what percentage of these new designer drugs or high potency drugs are part of the overall infusion therapy mix that your technology would have a seismic improvement on care. 
Yeah, yeah, well, that's that's good. Um, I, men I mentioned uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, so uh, you know we, we'd need to dig into what specific medications could be administered in that case. Um, but that we got some fairly strong indications during our customer discovery that rheumatoid arthritis would be a good place uh, for us to operate. Um, also, uh, there was some indication on. Um, uh, using the device for potent antibiotics, especially in like a home care setting. So, you know, we'd be outside of a uh, hospital setting and, and into the home care and, and, and outpatient sort of setting. So um, we need to do some more customer, customer discovery, though, in those cases. Great. Thank you. Over to you, Nikia. Yeah, nice, nice job in your your presentation. I want to kind of pull on a thread that Rachel <laughs> mentioned. I love that she identified what are you thinking about down the road, um, and specifically around the cell count, cell type, and that whole thing. That's critical, right? And inside the biomanufacturing process, um, and quality, viability, sustainability is always a big issue, um, and scaling up the next generation of therapies. So, where do you so? So in that, if you guys plan that space, so will you kind of, is there any plan to kind of reach out to CDMOs, CMOs, and just kind of, uh, is that part of your, your business plan, business model? Because I can see this being one component inside that scale manufacturing um, 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 chain there. Yeah, Nikia, that that's encouraging that you saw that because we're we're looking at playing in the horizontal infrastructure space with bio platform and, and next gen bioanalytic systems, mm -hmm. um, and so because it's a, a measurement technology, we don't want to limit ourselves just to uh, one particular flow meter, which is a bench top technology that that people use uh, now um, in in R and D. Uh, but we'd like to see uh, how to, how we could integrate with um, bio uh, platform builders, but also uh, provide uh, tools and sensors for CDMOs, like you mentioned. Um, and and uh, we've had some conversation in that space. We'd like to have more, um, mm -hmm. but we we've had some very promising uh, conversations. In fact, we had a conversation with a um, San Diego based uh, bio platform builder. Uh, and they're looking for exactly what we're selling and as far as uh, real-time awareness around uh, liquid uh, management, liquid flow management um, for their system. And so that was a very encouraging conversation that we had. Oh, thank you so much. And nice job, Jason. Thank you. And I have to say, your, your name's familiar. I believe I owe you an email. <laughs> you do. It's okay. You do. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll just hop in here for the last question. Uh, great job. That was a, what a wonderful, very clear presentation. Um, I'm interested in, in this decision that you, that, that you guys had to make eventually about really focusing on a standalone flow meter or, and, and commercializing something independent of anyone else or whether you really want to engage an existing, um, uh, a manufacturer that could incorporate your, your flow meter into their technology. Mm -hmm. um, and so for, for the latter, have you, how much traction have you had? Um, and what has, what has been the outcomes of that, of that approach? As, as far as the possibility of us getting into a, a, a medical device. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, so we've had a lot of conversations uh, with um, uh, some some large medical device builders, uh, and and um, I, I think that is a real possibility for for us. Uh, we it's in, important, and and I'm open to um, you know counter arguments here, but but we'd like to focus on um, delivering a, a standalone device that that proves what um, what we can deliver. So so. We're focusing in on this prototype uh, for a standalone flow meter. We want to be able to point to that when we're going to, um, you know, platform builders or medical device makers and say, you know, this is the capability we have at this scale, and we can miniaturize it even further. Um, so, so we want to we wanted to prove out the technology, build the credibility, and then be able to point to that when we're having these um, engagements with uh, larger companies or more uh, sophisticated companies. Um, and, and I would just comment, I mean, I used to do a lot of flow cytometry um, 
Okay. I'm a recovering immunologist, so <laughs> I, it's it's been a minute since. Do you inoculate yourself it. or? <laughs> All right. <laughs> but um, you know, Beck and Dickinson has quite a significant monopoly on the flow cytometry market. I think that there are other players that were coming up. Sony came out with theirs and BioRed came out with theirs and it was it was really difficult to compete. Um, mm. and, and I I've sat in many flow cytometry cores and um, those instruments were just kind of ignored by everyone and they just kind of gun for the fortesses of the world. Um, now that was that was at least five years ago. And so I don't know how the market has changed a little bit and the cytometers have gotten way more sophisticated, um, but just something to something to consider uh, because they might be uh, a company to approach with your technology as opposed to trying to compete with, with somebody with such a uh, strong footprint in the, mm. in that set, in that market. Yeah, thank you. That, that mirrors the feedback we've been hearing in, in our stakeholder interviews. So that, that's that's good to confirm with you, Ernesto. Thank you. All right, judges, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. If not, we can move right along to the next team. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and then last but not least, we have Team Halex. They're led by Lauren McDonough as the CEO, Michael Silk as the Chief Research Officer, and Peter Pichniski as the Chief Technical Officer. They're working on an artificial membrane lung system with an air pump, CO2 sensor, and automatic feedback controller to automatically control patient blood CO2 levels. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to meet with us. We're Halex, a company providing groundbreaking technology that will revolutionize the way care is provided to patients with end-stage lung disease and patients that are on ECMO, which stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. We've identified three core problems that are solved by our technology. First and foremost, all artificial lung and ECMO systems on the market today require extensive hands-on control from highly trained professionals. This human involvement contains high risk for error, but also takes valuable time away from the providers. Second, Arterial blood gas draws, known as ABGs, lead to increased risk of infection. Our research tells us that 12% of patients on ECMO receive a hospital-related infection from these blood draws, and as many as 25,000 deaths occur annually from infections from the blood draws. Third, today ECMO technology is only utilized in the ICU. It is utilized as a bridge to recovery or to lung transplant, and is not a viable option for all lung disease patients. There are no long-term devices on the market today that allow a patient to be treated outside of the ICU or the hospital setting. We have direct solutions for all three of these problems. A CO2 sensor that automatically determines the CO2 level in the patient, allowing the medical team to concentrate on other prevalent tasks while ensuring the patient is well-maintained. Number two, an ECMO attachment device with an automatic feedback loop that provides real-time data to the healthcare team and automatically adjusts CO2 removal based on the needs of the patient. This decreases time needed for rehabilitation while significantly reducing the frequency of the blood gas draws by 80%. Number three, our portable smart lung, which will remove patients from the ICU setting. This provides tremendous value to both providers and the patients. For providers, being able to treat the patient outside of the ICU floor opens up already tightly constrained resources. For patients, the quality of life is significantly increased as the portable device encourages mobility and decreases rehabilitation time. This device will be designed to provide breathing functions for use in other hospital wings and outside of the hospital setting as a long-term option for patients that are not candidates for ECMO and currently have very few options available to them. In short, we wanna bring these patients home. So how are we gonna accomplish our goals? Our products are designed in a stepwise fashion that builds upon each other to create our portable smart lung. The CO2 sensor attaches to the ex exhaust gas of already existing devices and utilizes an algorithm that correlates the exhaust gas values to the blood gas levels, allowing for accurate real-time reading of these values. Next, we add the automated feedback loop to the sensor, which will also attach to existing devices and automatically regulate the removal of CO2 based on the patient's needs. This will be an agnostic system that can be attached to any existing ECMO device on the market today. Last, our fully portable smart lung, which will be designed as a wearable device incorporating many of the already available components seen in ECMO today. In the hospital setting where oxygenation is needed, this device will be able to hook up to the necessary gas mixtures. In an at-home setting, this device will be utilized as an air, with an air blower, mimicking the uh, 
ability of the lungs to draw these gases directly from the environment around us. The benefit of having each of our products build upon one another is that by the time we're ready to move into further development of our smart lung, two of the major components comprising this product are already established and trusted within the field. Artificial lung devices are a fairly new invention with a rapidly growing market. To date, the global market for all therapeutic respiratory devices is valued at $18 billion. Of that market, our technology fits into approximately $3.3 billion of serviceable market. With three products in our pipeline, we can certainly expect to capture 5% of the serviceable market, which is well under even 1% of the total market, resulting in $157 million of obtainable value. There are zero companies today that offer wearable artificial lung. We are pioneers in this space. While many of the competitors may have a CO2 sensor, the methods for establishing the blood gas values differ greatly from our algorithm, and none of the products have the ability to respond to the changing needs of the patient. Although A Lung and Breathe have created more mobile lung devices, they are not wearable devices and must be utilized in a hospital setting. We can look to our competition to see what might be in store for Halix in the coming years. A Lung and Breathe are particularly interesting because both have been acquired for $110 million right around the time that they received FDA approval. This informs our team of a potential exit strategy in the years to come, while Spectrum, which has chosen to diversify their pipeline to a much greater extent, is currently valued at $1 billion. Each of our products has its own defined regulatory pathway. Our CO2 sensor is considered a class two device that will require a 510K submission. There are predicates on the market with which we can compare and no special controls or extensive testing required. The ECMO attachment is also considered a class two device, but unlike the sensor, it will require in vivo testing. To date, the inventor's lab has already conducted some large animal studies, which may be built upon in the future to ensure the success of a 510K submission. The wearable smart lung device, which makes us pioneers within this field, straddles two different regulations as a CO2 removal device and an extracorporeal circuit for a long-term respiratory failure. Both of these codes are classified as a class two device with special controls that require in vivo testing. Since there is nothing currently on the market that aligns directly with our product, there is a chance that it may have to be a de novo submission, which will require further testing and possibly clinical studies. Our submission strategy and development timelines currently account for the de novo status. To date, $1.1 million have already been invested into the development of these products within the inventor's lab. We have developed our timeline to reflect, reflect what work still needs to be conducted prior to commercialization. We expect to commercialize our CO2 sensor by 2025, followed shortly after by the automated feedback loop in 2026. Due to the possible de novo status of our smart lung, we have placed the commercialization of this product in the year 2030. I would like everybody to meet the team that will take Halix into the next stage as a medical device pioneer. This is the team that will bring the patients home. There's myself, Lauren McDonough, CEO of Halix. I've spent my career so far in the commercialization of pharmaceuticals in the field of oncology and rare diseases. Michael Silk, our chief growth officer, who has over 13 years experience selling directly to hospitals for several companies that have also found exits. Peter Pachonsky, our chief technology officer, who has a background as an engineer developing products in the medical device space. And last but certainly not least, our inventor, Joseph Pake, who has dedicated his life to finding innovative ways to help patients with lung disease and remains committed to seeing these inventions bring patients a much higher standard of care than what is currently available on the market today. To sum up, we wanted to highlight some of the important milestones we'll be tackling in the coming months. From now until June, we are in the process of establishing our headquarters close to Joseph's lab and working through the details of our options agreement. From July through August, we begin the process of requesting local and federal funds. It's in, in September, we plan on having proof of concept lab established and our regulatory pathway redefined. By December, we start on our external POC studies for the CO2 sensor that will propel us forward into 2024. We invite each and every one of you to take part in this journey with us and help us bring these patients home. Our ask is for you to help us broaden our ecosystem as we go through the next step. You can find us at halix.com or through LinkedIn. Again, thank you so much for your time today. We will now take any questions that you may have. All right, judges, over to you. All right, I'll 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 kick us off here. Didn't see anyone else jumping in. Lauren, really nice job on that pitch. Um, yeah, very very nicely done. Nice story, nice uh, cadence to it as well. Um, I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about the underlying IP and how that uh, really supports your differentiation and competitiveness in the market, but then also how does it align to the different products you're working on developing through commercialization over the next couple of years? 
So the underlying IP is about the um, CO2 removal. And so each right. component that you see there is, you know, part of that build out. And the structure that we show is actually from the patent itself. So you can actually go in and find that figure. Um, so what we did was kind of work backwards and saw the ultimate goal and then figured out what along the way we needed to figure out for each of those components. And then saw a need for, we went back to our customer discovery and saw a need for those components themselves prior to actually launching the full smart loan product. So we started with like the big picture that you see that's scheduled for 2030 and just kind of smashed it and said, okay, where can this be used? Is this something that's viable? And we went back to our, um, you know, doctors that we were speaking to and uh, other individuals in the field uh, to kind of determine if those were a good fit for market. Then do you have plans to file additional IP? on those earlier technologies as well before you get to that final at 2030? So uh, we were in discussion about the algorithms for the CO2 sensor in particular. And, um, you know, talking with the university about that, they said that they really don't file a patent for the algorithm. We're going to have to have talks if we're going to need to protect that uh, later on or if that's just a given trade secret. So we, we are, um, you know, thinking about that moving forward, how we're going to, you know, apply for those patents if they're needed. Um, so yeah, that is in our mindset right now as well. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Um, I think Nakia had his hand up first. Nope, Ernesto. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. Um, excellent presentation. Um, there was a lot of information, and and, and I, I would just um, comment that you might, you, you might want to consider slowing down just a little bit because you speak quite <laughs> fast, quite naturally. Um, but it's very clear it's just a lot of information in a very short amount of time um, and I'm, I'm a little bit new to to this space but um, my question to you is with this wearable lung that folks can take home they're not able to breathe without it right that's to substitute what's helping them breathe at the hospital is that correct yeah so you know based on ECMO devices now that's what's giving their lungs a break um, how the setup's going to be in the end with these patients, obviously the functionality of, you know, applying the oxygen and then removing the CO2 is going to be what's occurring through the system. So the lungs aren't going to have to function. Um, you know, if we can keep them available for talking and, you know, kind of utilizing it that way, I, I'm not sure how exactly that's going to play out yet, but it's going to take the functionality and put it into the system. The other reason why I, I ask is because um something you know something that would sustain life like that if, if that's what the aim is you know, might, might might push you into a class three category for your for your for that po portion of the device um in which case pre-market approval would be necessary um and, and so depending on the extent to which your medical claims suggest that it's it's just assisting versus sustaining, then it might be a class two to know one. Um, but thank you, I think that was helpful. Yeah, no, nice job, Lauren, on your presentation. Very, very, very thorough um, and just your detailed explanation. Um, I have a, a comment and, just, and then a question about strategy. Um, you know, you see this often too many times where people are innovating, creating and building deep disruptive technologies that can benefit the patient overall. <clears throat> but there's other factors that during this innovation process that are not considered, right? In terms of the market adoption risks, reimbursement, consumer drivers, physician and patient adoption of this, right? Are they asking? Are they demanding? Um, how often does this treatment actually happen? You know, is the market big enough for them to do that? Is there a reimbursement strategy to this? Should we suggest this as a solution, right? Are there other secondary you know, items that uh, that are working just fine in terms of just introducing a new technology, right? Or even if it's something inside the hospital, you know, you get some value analysis committee that said, you know what, we've got 20 other solutions that work better. We don't need this, right? And then there's no reimbursement strategy for it. And, and then doctors are not even going to recommend it, right? Or patients are not even going to use it. So when you think of the totality of the ecosystem, continue to do more customer discovery as you're navigating through this trial, right? And kind of seeing where your technology is. Um, and to learn to adapt alongside um, that timeline um, as you're navigating through this. Um, so I, meant, I heard you mention an SBIR. My question to you is, is why not an STTR? Because it sounds like that there's more R&D that has to happen. And it would seem that it would work really, really well to have 
a strong clinical partner that's working in this area around lung and air and oxygen in this space um, that could help you um, navigate. So we're actually looking into both options. Okay. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, that's all I have. Uh, thank you. Nice job there, Lauren. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from our judges? We have time for one or two more. Yes, sorry, John. I was on mute talking about complimenting Lauren. So, Lauren, like uh, echoing the other judges, you're very articulate. It's a, it's, you're accomplished a lot uh, from that perspective. When you do your kind of stage gate or stage development program, where do you see the, the first CO2 uh, aspect of it? Coming into market, I think I, I noticed that. Was there was there any uh, kind of funds or pricing that we put together for this uh, compared to? Uh, so we've been we've been looking into pricing strategies. We have to do a lot more work around that. For the yeah. CO2 sensor itself, there's you know a lot of predicates on the market, um, and we're we've noticed with our competitors, especially Spectrum, they have a CO2 um, sensor out there, but it's part of like this larger package that they're charging about forty thousand dollars for. So, um, and there's no ability to automatically regulate the CO2. So we're, we're coming in with like these two-step projects. So the CO2 sensor itself, which is just gonna attach to the device is going to eliminate the need for more arterial blood gas draws, which is gonna be probably on the, you know, lower end of the spectrum um, and uh, just serve as in surgery or, you know, on a shorter time frame for use. And that's kind of where we see the indication as or moving towards there. Um, there's not really a lot in that space other than what Spectrum provides, and it's a much higher um, cost than what we're expecting. I can't really give you straight numbers yet, but you know it's gonna be on the lower end. For the automatic feedback loop, um, it's probably gonna be more on par with what they have, but it's gonna be smarter. It's gonna have that system that actually automatically removes the CO2, and you don't have to go through the sweep process, and it's gonna be a lot more hands-off. Um, the reason that we're pulling up this strategy is with the CO2 sensor, when we go and uh, actually commercialize that, it's going to you know, prove our uh, algorithm. It's going to show that we have that correlation and we're gonna focus on that first because that's a really big component of the smart lung. And then the second step, the automated feedback loop is also a huge component of the smart lung. So we get those two products out there and trusted by the medical team, then you know, moving to this wearable device that you know, we've, we've had so many different discussions and customer discovery about this where, you know, doctors are coming to us and saying, this is a game changer. If you can pull this off, you're going to be, you know, doing a great thing for the field. Um, and then other people going, you know, you're not gonna be able to do this. So getting that feedback, you know, uh, having this stepwise approach is more of creating that trust and creating, you know, here's, here's our benefit, here's what you're seeing, and here's the uh, data coming out of those two products that are building into this. All right, one more question for Alex, maybe. If not, we can move right along here. All right, so fantastic jobs to all the teams that pitched today. You know, I, I'm gonna keep saying it, but it's really, really incredible to see all the progress that you've made throughout the course of this program. So I'm going to leave this call with the judges. We're going to recuse ourselves for a few minutes to like finally tabulate the scores, um, figure out who the winner from the pitch competition was, and we'll be back in a few minutes. But in the meantime, I'm going to leave you with Joel with some more information about FedTech, uh, our upcoming programs, and some of the other events that our partners are putting on. So we'll be right back in a few minutes with the winner of the competition here. Awesome. Yeah. So congratulations to all our participating teams uh, this afternoon. And of course, a big thanks to everyone in attendance and the audience. Um, so we just got to see uh, the culmination of a bunch of hard work that our entrepreneurs have put in over the past six months. And if this was interesting to anyone in attendance, I'd like to invite you to visit our website at fedtech.io to learn more about some of our other programs. This includes an upcoming uh, NASA Climate Tech Startup Studio that we'll be launching, as well as other um, studios in partnership with agencies such as the DOD and Ensign, um, Homeland Security uh, uh, Startup Studio that we 
that we've just recently launched and a upcoming quantum computing studio as well. Additionally, you can subscribe to join our newsletter to stay abreast of upcoming opportunities, both within FedTech and among our partners as well. Uh, one such opportunity is an upcoming Blue Night Symposium on, that will be held on June 4th. Uh, that's a joint initiative between uh, Johnson & Johnson Innovations and BARDA, and that will host a global conversation among innovators, investors, partners, and thought leaders to help discover potential solutions uh, for future pandemics and public health uh, risks. So I believe both of those links were just dropped in the chat by my colleague, Emmanuel. I'd invite everyone to visit both and check out some of the exciting stuff we have on the horizon. And with that, I will go back to our five minute break while the judges deliberate over the pitches we just held and hopefully we'll be coming back to announce our winners pretty soon.
All right, folks, we're back with the winner. Share my screen. All right, so the judge and I just came out of our deliberation session, and I want to congratulate Team Halex. Very nicely done, folks. Uh, the pitch was great. This was a really close decision, I want to say. I want to give a shout out to Lumos for coming in second place. Excellent presentation there as well. And I'd want to, I want to put the spotlight on uh, Lauren, Michael, and Peter again. If you'd like, guys like to say a few words. Wow. <laughs> Thank you guys for this. And um, I think it definitely boosts our confidence moving forward. We just kind of had our chat going for a minute. Um, no, we're very, very excited about moving this technology along. And, you know, this was kind of our first real pitch to all together. So um, I think this, this is showing what this technology can do and what we're going to be able to bring to the table for patients in the future. And just thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. Anybody else from the team? All right. All good. So again, fantastic job. You know, you guys have made some really incredible progress and so have all the teams. You know, these are some really, really fantastic pitches we heard today. Um, and, you know, I, I want to offer encouragement to everyone, you know, these, even if you didn't win, the just looking back, the progress that all the teams have made in this whole program has been really, really incredible. So as the as the winner here, Team Halix is also going to get um, an additional fifteen hundred dollars worth of in kind um, time from FedTech and support from us in in coaching, additional networking, things like that. And we're also going to continue the program uh, with all the teams, you know, even even the ones that did not win here today, um, to really you know make sure that we, you're making as much progress um, and piggybacking on all the work you did here in the program. All right, so I got a lot, lots of thank yous. This has been a really incredible program. Um, I want to thank our judges today, first and foremost, all the teams. You've done a fantastic job. Uh, the labs, you know, with that technology that you guys all put together in the first place, none of this would have been possible. Um, also, our sponsors, you know, the support from BARDA has been fantastic, and this as well. And I want to thank everyone else for attending today. You know, it's a, a big two hour chunk out of the middle of your day, and I really, really value everyone's participation. So with that, we can wrap things up here. You know, if you're interested in learning more about FedTech, the kind of programming we, we run, you know, feel free to reach out to me um, personally. My name is John.Boyer at FedTech.io or email is John.Boyer at FedTech.io. And then if you are just curious, you know, feel free to look us up online as well. All right. Thank you very much, folks.